So then it would have just been like literally you the whole time just going, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, <laughs> me. Uh, Nobody wants that. <laughs> yeah, you can see I don't do a lot of planning, so there's nothing to be nervous about. You can just say whatever and it won't be off the script because there is no script. So it is, uh, that's how I always look at it. Even when I do like my work presentations, it's like nobody knew what those slides were supposed to like what I was supposed to say when I got to slide seven or whatever. So as long as I just say something, then they just think that was like the plan all along. And they're like, oh my God, how well thought out it was. Um, I got, I'm, I'm the same way at work, but uh, so I'm hoping that that will pay off here. Yeah. But oh, you're good. Just... <sighs> Somebody asked me to go, Pete asked me to go do like the, like something Midnight Tides spoiler cast episode for 10 very big books. And I was like, dude, I haven't read Midnight Tides. So I was like all trying to bone up and stuff, but it's fine. You just talk about the stuff you remember. Um, cool. All right. Well, I guess I'll just do my little thing and then we'll go for it. Are you good? Okay. It sounds right. good. You look good. So. <laughs> okay. Let's yeah. do it. Piece of cake. We got this. What mm -hmm. up and welcome back to another Malazan Book of the Fallen video. Super excited to get the first dibs on Quick Gen, which is one of my absolutely favorite new channels. She's like come out of the gate with a bang, such sick videos on characters that I absolutely love. I don't know if you intentionally set out to like win me specifically over, but uh, you, you kind of hit it right out of the gate with a couple of back-to-back -back home runs. And so I'm so thankful to have you here. And it's on a topic that I thought was, uh, you know, gave us some good overlap because you're, you know, picked at least for two of the three, you picked two of my favorite bone hunters. And we kind of, I don't know what the, we're going to have to come up with better verbiage, but we're like always like broing out just over like kind of those similar uh, aspects. And so I, I appreciate you being here to talk bridge burners with me because I just finished the, uh, the third book. And, and so I figured we could have a kind of up to the third book, non-spoiler chat past that for a bit, and then maybe talk spoilers at the end. But first and, and foremost, thank you so much for, for coming on. I'm a huge, huge fan. Thank you so much for having me on. I'm a bigger fan, I promise <laughs> you. Uh, yours is, I think, the very first Malazan video I ever watched on YouTube, the first channel I ever subscribed to. Um, <laughs> so I'm so excited to be here. Thank you so much. And the fact that we're talking about bridge burners, we're talking about Malaz and soldiers, like, ah, yeah, right up my alley. Um, I always say if I have a favorite character in these books, it's the Malaz and soldier. Well, that's what I was going to ask you, because like, why did you, you know, come out of the gate with those specific ones? I know you said you wanted to pick like, uh, or focus in on humor, which is a conversation we're hoping to have down the road. But, uh, you know, and I think the soldiers get that. But I'm curious just to know that that, you know, because that's why I, I get these books too, or that's one of the aspects that I really latch on to, but I'm just curious, like, I'm always like, why, why does that work for you? I, I well, we can talk about the humor, um, yeah. hopefully at a future one, but uh, in terms of the characters I chose, uh, that was, I just went with the ones I loved really. Yeah. Um, and, and ones that I think I hadn't really seen anybody else talk about a whole lot. Yeah. Um, weren't necessarily getting the love and love it. Um, I wanted to shine a spotlight on them. So that was, that was my thinking. Yeah. And of course, you know, wanting to hit all your favorite sister. Yeah, exactly. Cause <laughs> that's, like I said, you couldn't have, uh, you couldn't have planned that better to, to win me over. So, uh, yeah, I guess we will do some, uh, spoiler talk at the end maybe cause, cause I'm curious to know what you think about, uh, the end, but the first three books, and I'm talking to Mike about this next week too. Cause I always think like, the first three books are kind of like the bridge burners books really right it's kind of like the first act of the series in a way but they're really the the kind of hook at least for me again i'm a sucker for the the kind of soldier stuff but their story really starts with in gardens of the moon and in some ways you know concludes with with the end of of memories of ice so um you know they they come in and you get this kind of pretty epic series of of intros what did you think when you just first kind of met the the bridge burners was it like instant sucked in or curiosity or what i think curious at first and then um god we can talk about this scene a little more later but you know what i remember what stands out is when paran goes to the bar where they're all playing cards and has that whole interaction with them uh he leaves oh, yeah. and I'm like 
wait, I want to go back to that game. Like, I just want to go hang out with those guys for a little bit longer. Totally. <laughs> um, and in terms of the arc, I, I, I remember, and I think probably most readers go through this that don't go in with a lot of um, knowledge about what the books are about, right. um, was wondering what the books were about really, right? Like <laughs> those first couple books, um, I'm talking about them all the time to my husband and I still, I'm like, I don't know what they're about. Like, I don't know how to explain what they're about. And there's these great characters and lots of plot lines going on, but I really don't. And I think maybe like a third of the way into Memories of Ice, I'm like, oh, I got it. Okay, I figured it out. And I told him all excited, like these books are about the bridge burners. Like yes. we're following the bridge burners. Yeah. Uh, so I was not ready for the end of Memories of Ice at all, because <laughs> totally. I was sure that they were going to be with us till the end. Yeah, no, that was like Memories of Ice for me is like the kind of Red Wedding equivalent. You know, I don't know if you did Ice and Fire, but I read those and it's like, you know, first you're thinking like, oh, my God, it's the like Ned Stark character is like, I get it. Like the, oh, the best friend dies and then now he's got to like stuff. And then it's like he dies. And then you're like, oh, but it's because the son then is going to like come in and do it. Right. And you're like, that's why all this. Time. And then it's like, no, no, it's not that at all. Um <laughs> Yeah, totally, totally brutal. For me, I was like sucked in right off the bat just because, you know, I'm like, I don't, what is going on with these dudes? They totally like get backstabbed. I'm like, I'm thinking, you know, they are obviously the the kind of good guys to the extent that there's a good guy, you know, and there, were, there was a lot of kind of mystery and, um, I you know, a lot of uh, reputation there and whatever. And so I was like, oh my God, I want to like find out more about these guys, but then what really kind of sealed it for me, which I think is early gardens is uh, Fiddler because they're having this like, uh, I don't know if it was a clandestine meeting, but it was like Dujek and Whiskey Jack were meeting uh -huh. Uh, on the roof and Fiddler's like off dicking off doing something and he's like just left his sword in the middle of a puddle and they're like bro your equipment dog and it, uh, and so I was like oh my god I love these guys and again the humor I guess yeah, see I, I think that's funny because you picked up on the same scene like for us I was the intrigue was great and I was yeah. sucked in absolutely but right. that moment when I fell in love all about the humor right? Like yeah. that one where you're like, okay, I want to hang out with these guys. <laughs> totally. And it's like in the midst of like all this serious stuff and there's like internal, you know, political squabbling happening and all this stuff. And you're like getting basically a lot of, uh, you know, backstory and lore and history kind of throughout that, that meeting and stuff. And then here's Fiddler just off totally like aloof and, you know, whatever. And, and that's kind of like, he maintains that vibe. And he's one of my, my favorite bridge burners too. But the other one that you mentioned is, which is kind of like the, you know, you have the first intro, I guess, right. Which is like the tatter sales POV yeah. and you get the whiskey Jack and the Callum, uh, and and your namesake, the quick Ben rolling up. And I guess, you know, and it's true. And and I don't know if you signed up, but I'm now like an undergraduate at, at Quick Ben University or at Ruth Ann Bad University. I, I am enrolled in uh, the Quick Ben certification course. Absolutely. Yeah. So I'm wor working towards that that degree. But he said that scene's not really, you know, about the the bridge burners. That's more about like setting up tatter sales whole plot line and stuff like that but that was like another moment where you were like holy cow like who are these dudes I, I i agree but at the same time it's also our first impression of them and it's it begins this idea of of these men and women as legends yeah that they are coming with this history and this reputation and and tragedy yeah the, the tragedy part is all like mixed in too. And that's like what is crazy about the the bridge runners because it's not till way later that we go back and see the kind of pre, you know, the origin story or whatever that, that Whiskey Jack relays to, to Rake, but we pick up with them and they're basically all super pissed off and have just been double crossed and like half or more of them have been wiped out and they, you know, they feel like their empire that they've, you know, sweated and done all this stuff has, has turned their back. So they also have that kind of for the, the compassionate empathizers, you know, I'm a sucker for the, the kind of wounded, whatever that I want to like bring in for the hug and stuff. And, mm -hmm. and so they had that going too. And it's sad. Um, even a lot of the humor stems from that. Uh, there's, there's this, uh, 
this lack of trust yeah um that shows itself even in the ways that they a lot of the funny scenes and the way they interact with other people because the bridge burner burners they're always unless you're in unless you're one of them they're always holding something back yeah um and i mean that's particularly true of quick ben but I, you see it with all of the bridge burners um i think like uh in memories of ice there's that scene where picker and blend are in the smuggler's path uh-huh and he, when I, and the whole time they just come across as like these, like they really don't care about their job. They're not, they're more interested in doing a little shopping in his backpack than they are actually soldiering. Yeah. Um, and it's not until he leaves that we find out that all of that was about getting across the message to smugglers and kind of an opportunity to sneak quick Ben's little pebble into his pack. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and you see that all the time that, that what, the bridge burners show to the world is not necessarily what's really going on. They're always holding something back. Um, my favorite example is actually probably uh, Trotz talking to Peran. Um, uh-huh. And he's got like this weird, like mystic, like he keeps saying all these things that don't make sense. And and it's really, I think our first introduction to Trotz, isn't yeah. it? I know he's mentioned a little bit in the other book, but we don't but really get to say know. much, yeah. Yeah, I think it was at the card game. Um, and so we as readers don't know, we just think that that he's some sort of like a mystic guy and it's some sort of tribal thing going on that has all this meaning. And then uh, Pran leaves and I think it's Hedge that comes up and he's like, are you still, are you still fucking with Pran? And he's like, yeah. <laughs> I love that so much. Sorry, not... I... Oh, yeah. Okay I... yep. Oh, you you're good. That reason on. You're good. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's no holds barred here. But uh, no, those are like two great ones. And that was when, you know, I specifically love that first one for Picker because I think Picker is like another one of those hugely um, underserved characters. We need, you know, more Picker videos Mm -hmm. in the, in the community, but you know, she's playing like three dimensional chess there and there's like multiple different currents and she's like pulling Munug's leg. And like, also, you know, like you said, doing all the kind of uh, like clandestine, like whatever they call that warfare, like, of you know what I mean? Like mental warfare and all that on these, like, um, you know, to try and like, they, it, and it's so interesting too. And it's like a broader commentary on the bigger empire, how they like, you know, allow these people to think they're getting like, the, you know, they let them get a little bit over on them. You know what I mean? They let them smuggle a little bit. They let them evade a little bit of taxes and think, because you know, and that keeps them from kind of like uh, having these bigger ambitions and stuff but like for picker who at that point was a corporal right um to be like kind of doing all all that stuff and is is just again shows how badass these people are right because they're like you know you think they're just like that like you said the ones who are just sitting around waiting for orders smoking cigarettes sticking off and she's like you know got her own game going so Mm -hmm. she's she's amazing she's one of my absolute favorites and I think the picker and blend thing, like I'm going to do a, I got to do a, a like best uh, romances or best duos. Well, they would, they'd fit both, but they're just like, a, you know, they got that perfect little kind of tag team and the irreverent, like bantery, uh, you know, balancing each other's uh, personality. So I, I really like that. What about the, were you a sucker for the, the kind of, you know, Animander Rake side. Actually, before I go to the Animander Rake thing, I do want to touch on because it it's again that kind of what they show to the the rest of the world thing that you said is, mm-hmm. you know, even within the bridge burners, they do that. You know what I mean? And I think that's like kind of how they process the tragedy in some ways is like they harden themselves and just kind of have to take that lighthearted whatever approach but one of the other parts that really got me and everybody says that well, I don't know if everybody says but it is said that Whiskey Jack can be you know an overrated character or one of those uh ones where Erickson actually did tell not show uh, which mm-hmm. I think you know those you know they can apologize to me later but um <laughs> you know the the end part when he's like thinking about after all the tragedy and they're like going off to Darugistan he's like shit these like people are my friends you know what I mean and he's like been trying to wall himself off from all the the emotion and he he can't do it and I'm like there was definitely some kind of 
um, bro moments from from Whiskey Jack that that weren't just show not tell or vice versa. But the thing is, I mean, because we get quite a few of Whiskey Jack's uh, like POVs. Yeah, internal those, monologue. Yeah, and all yeah. That. Um, and he may like. I think he tries to come off as as being detached, but I mean, from the very beginning, you see how much you, he loves all of them and how much it kills him to have to put them in danger. Um, it, it's, and you know, what surprised me too, I think last time around, because I did sort of have this idea of, of that reputation um, superseding any of his actions is yeah. how often he actually brings the other soldiers into his inner circle and talks to them about what's going on, um, which we know is unusual in the empire. It's unusual in the army. Um, and, and to me, that's what speaks to the fact that like, no matter where he may be placed, whether he's directly over them or not, or, or a part of their squad or not, he is at heart a bridge burner because like when things are going down, when, uh, when they're having the, I don't know what it's called, but everybody's coming together um, kind of towards the beginning of Memories of Ice. They're meeting mm. with Brood and Rake and, yeah. and all of those. Um, he's got his own stuff going on and it's Quick Ben and Mallet that he's pulling aside and talking to about all of this stuff. Totally. Um, Keeping an eye on Perrin, what's going on with his mm -hmm. shenanigans and all that. Yeah, he's a he's a dude. He, he does a lot and he, you know, he does uh, the it's funny because even when he gets busted out because he's a sergeant at this point right and yeah. um he used to be like i don't know what his official rank was but he was like high up there you know like the equivalent basically of a do jack or somebody like that and so i i'm just gonna tell you now for somebody who loves the soldiers i don't know anybody's rank i'm not gonna get it right at all i'm just <laughs> yeah like, no but so you're good <laughs> he was a big dog though you know yeah. originally and he gets like busted down and it's like he's not all bitter and resentful and like going around uh you know like the hairlock who's like grumbling and griping the whole time because he's been like screwed over and um you know he just kind of takes it on the chin and like you said he's like you know he's gonna do the job whether he's a sergeant or whatever and um do you know he looks out for his people and that's like the kind of guy that that breeds that that's why it's believable you know i don't know anything about the kind of like literary side and stuff and show don't tell and all that and i get what they're saying i can like connect the dots at least on on that part but like um you know for me it's believable because those are the type of dudes who are gonna or people you know who are gonna just breed that kind of loyalty someone who's you know not doing it for the ego side of it and like you said brings people in it's not like oh i i kind of um rise by standing on people and the more you know if people come up to me then i'm not on top of it you know there's like that whole kind of approach and you see it in the workplace just in like real life and stuff like that and like uh that's why you know i don't know if i was shown or told or what but it's believable because it's like yeah those are those are the cool dudes who you're like bro i will take a bullet for you mm -hmm. yeah so. um and that's the other place you see it is is the way his soldiers talk about him and yeah. um and their absolute loyalty and they do anything for the guy and and i get it i mean yeah, I absolutely get it. Love Whiskey Jack. Yeah. And so what do you think about the the kind of origin story? Because we got to talk about Quick Ben a little bit and all of that stuff. But I love the whole thing where he tells Rake how they got, you know, Quick Ben and Callum in there because it shows off cool stuff about Whiskey Jack. It shows off cool stuff about Fiddler. Uh, and of course, like, you know, again, just going to what you just said through the eyes of the soldiers, like that was enough to turn ultimately Callum and, and Quick Ben to be like, sign me up, brother. Um, yeah, I, I've heard, like, I know, or I've read somewhere that there's kind of the talk of like, well, how much of that is true? How much do we really know? Mm. I, I, I don't know. I don't care. I buy a hundred percent. I love it as an origin story. Yes. <laughs> um, and uh, I think, it's nice because it's one of the few places where we get that because like um, like you said, when we meet them, they're legends. They're pretty much at, at the tail end of their story. Yeah. Um, we And we only know they're legends because we hear other people say it or think it. Um, and, and this is really, I think our only chance, I and mean, there might be a few stories about like my, 
woods and yeah, the the black dog, dog forest. Yeah. That's not you don't really get to see any of that. And this is so this is sort of our only glimpse into the bridge burners before they were the bridge burners, before they were the legend and, and what brought them together. Um, and I think it's especially nice that that we don't get it until Memories of ISB because by then we've been in Rark. We know that desert, we know that place. We, we can picture it in our minds as they're talking about it and we know how intense it is. Um, and so it all the pieces just fit together in a way they wouldn't have, I think, if we'd learned it right at the beginning. Yeah. Totally. No, and I think that's like one of the reasons why we love, you know, the Guinnabacus storyline. And like when you go in later in the books, you know, you whenever you come back, I think it's because that's where we first met the bridge burners. That's where we, you know, hit the ground. You're kind of like, you know, parents to stand in for us in some ways yeah. where it's like you're you're trying to you're same same boat as him, right? Like trying to figure these people out and I, I, again, I don't know anything about the writing, but that's why Gardens of the Moon worked for me is because I felt like we were Ganos, you know what I mean? It's like you, you come into this crew, then it's like, oh my God, you're supposed to like work with them. They got a reputation for like killing, you know, their own superiors. If they don't like them, they like, you know, when they meet them at that card game that you, you know, they weren't uh, very deferential to his to his rank there and we're giving him a, a hard time so um, I like that like kind of riding riding shotgun with Ganos because it is our way of like kind of kind of figuring out you know what's going on and who those who those people are I don't know absolutely uh it, it's uh well, first of all, I don't know about you, but like I, I think the first time the whole they, you know, stab their captains in the back or they have a habit of killing officers, yeah. I took it as a joke. Yeah. And and just kind of like, like a oh, watch ha, your ha, back. That's so funny. And then the more you're reading, it's like, I mean, it is kind of a joke, but it's not a joke. <laughs> like this is this is deadly serious to them because they know that officers that don't know what they're doing get them killed. And um so, but like you were saying about Pran in that moment, because we identify with Pran, because he's our entry and we see this really tight knit little group that obviously has this history and these inside jokes and this bond, when Pran actually comes out of that, okay, there's kind of this feeling of pride, like, damn, he did it. He stepped up and, and made them all kind of pay attention to him. Yeah, no, and, and that's like uh, one of the uh, kind of gratifying parts of the whole you know, three book thing is that, you know, by the end, I think Ganos does, you know, get the acceptance. I think it's mm -hmm. when Trotz goes and does the thing and they're wondering if they're going to survive his challenge to be, you know, mm -hmm. whatever, become the, the bar gas, become one of the war leaders or whatever it's called. And then, uh, he can see they're all like scheming and getting anxious and some of the ones have like their munitions and they're getting mm -hmm. ready like we're gonna bomb our way out of here if we have to and so he's like whoa bro like kick kick it you guys calm down and he tries to like exert some leadership and there's one I don't remember this person's name but they came over and they were like the spokesman for all these people who basically were like questioning the his leadership and whatever but eventually he kind of like uh you know wins them over but even that guy's like yeah we actually he's like i think that person even said like i wouldn't you know he's like what if i demoted you or did this or that and he's like i wouldn't do that he's like last guy who did that he's like i actually i think he admitted to actually killing like, one yeah like i uh, know i killed the last guy who tried to demote me so uh <laughs> um but yeah, he makes it I, eventually I, I, and he gets it and then you're like yeah so and it, it was such a process, which is why it was so rewarding when he does, because I think that scene you're talking about, that was kind of when I was starting to feel like, oh, okay, they're starting to like see that he is competent, that he's got what it takes, that he can be a leader. And then um, after that in Kapistan, there's the scene on the rooftop with Brentel um, where they find out he's been withholding information yeah, um, and and not necessarily like because um, he's trying to keep things tight to his chest, but because it's it's he's dealing with his own stuff and he just isn't able to talk about it, right? Yeah. But they know that not being in the loop is, is gonna get them killed. And there's a point where they're all ready to turn on him. Um, and then it's Mallet that actually steps up mm -hmm. and kind of puts them all in their place and, and, and tells them like, this is what he's dealing with. Um, but even even that late in the game, right? They're still like not entirely a hundred percent. Like they're still ready to turn on him if they think that he doesn't have their back. Yeah. Um, and and to me that that speaks to like how long their history is, 
and just kind of the scars from being betrayed, right? That it, it, it's not easy becoming a bridge burner. They don't just let anybody in. Um, yeah. No, definitely. And, and, you know, it's, uh, it's like kind of what makes them, I think, so good too, is that what, you know, it's like, it's a high threshold to, to kind of meet. And I think, you know, Ganos has the, the double whammy going for him of being, you know, an officer, oh, but an also being a kind of noble born, which they, mm -hmm. they don't trust because again, it comes down to competency, right? They're mm -hmm. like, we want to make sure that we don't get stuck through with a spear. We want to make sure we don't get blown up or we don't get stuff. And so it's like when he eventually does, and when you get there, um, that's like unbreakable type bonds. If, you know, if you can kind of step up to the challenge or meet it. Yeah, another good example of that is the fact that Sari was with them for two years and they never stopped calling her recruit. She was never a bridge burner. Yes, exactly. So, um, so yeah, it that. is a big deal to kind of make it in. And I don't know if he ever knows that he does until no quarrel. I mean, um, yeah. And pick her like in the keep they're in the keep and she says uh by the way all those knives at your back they've been turned the other way for a while now yeah and that was like oh dude that yes. was such a oh. like moment and he <laughs> kind of like gets it a little bit but it wasn't i think until the very end when then he goes and like that's the like uh bittersweetness of it right because then at the very end like him and quick ben do that one last little stop and they hit up uh moonspawn i think he even thinks about that like and and actually um that's where all the foreshadowing for later stuff happens but he goes you know he it, it took him all the way till basically the whole the whole you know team gets wiped out to finally become like a full-fledged member of the team poor Gano. yeah was it dujek that called him a bridge burner or was it who was it? I think it was Dujak who said you made it. Yeah. And he goes, look, you guys are decommissioned and blah, blah, blah. Like, basically, that. you're uh, you're a bridge burner. They don't exist anymore. Congratulations. Right. Yeah. You're the, the last and final <laughs> mm -hmm. inductee into the the very exclusive and now uh, extinct club of of the bridge burners. Um, what about uh, what about like kind of favorite bridge burners because we we get a lot more than than you know the kind of ones that that immediately spring to mind everybody thinks about like quick ben obviously and whiskey jack but there's some pretty cool bridge burners and i think you know your favorite bridge burners just say a lot about what you what type of stuff that you go for in the books in the first place so i'm curious just to hear like you know, which ones really resonate for you? You know, what's funny is, I didn't even think about it, but it's the same with kind of the, the characters I've talked about on my channel. You asked yeah. me favorite bridge burners and I immediately dismissed like, like uh, all the obvious ones. And I don't know why I do that, <laughs> except that because I love them, but it's also sort of like, well, everybody loves them. That's just a given, right? Like, yeah. like we can, well, of good. course I love, of Let's course go I love obscure them. Uh, uh, um, I mean, yeah, Fiddler's one of my favorite characters in all the books, same with Quick Ben. Um, but uh, it, I, it, I guess maybe to me, that's a less interesting conversation to have because uh, every, and I think anybody who's read these books has talked about how great Fiddler and Quick Ben are, uh, or Whiskey Jack or Clum or, you know, whoever, uh, whoever you happen to connect with. Um, and so, yeah, I do. I love the I love the underappreciated ones always. Um, I, I gotta put, also I am notorious for having, like I, I don't have favorites. I just have a list of why each one is my favorite. Yeah, so that, I'll I say, oh, that's that. my favorite. And then I'll say it about every character in the Bridge Burners. Um, yeah. but I, I've tried right, to so, do it. <laughs> I call out a picker and blend for sure. Yes. Um, and it's funny because I always do them as though they're one person. Like I can't separate out because so much of, I, I love them both individually and there's a lot there individually. It's not like they aren't fully fleshed out characters on their own, but there's something about that interaction that to me kind of is what puts them up at the top in terms of the, I guess, lesser talked about bridge burners. Yeah. Um, 
And Picker's uh, kind of like that herself too, right? At the end, like, you know, there's pretty much, it's like a non-negotiable thing when uh, Envy, she's like, hey, you got to sort this out, right? That's not like, a, it wasn't like a conversation. It was like, this is happening. Mm-hmm. Um, I love Trots. I really love Trots. I was, I was gutted when he died. Oh Ugh. my God. And such a sick ending though. At least he got like just a proper fitting bridge burner death but that one absolutely crushed me because hey i mean you already saw through the whole like uh thing where they get the bar gas on board basically mm -hmm. that like and i love that part too and i loved how you like fought in the bridge burners style you know what i mean instead of going like full um bar gas style and he just kind of like they're his tribe but it's it was you know, they're his client they're his client like he is a bridge burner <laughs> dude that was the best and then he like does, goes out saving him too you know what i mean like he was mm -hmm. holding down that tunnel or that stairway or whatever and just doing wreaking absolute havoc to save his homies and then he like realizes that they're safe and then he like smiles and just totally bites the dust and i was like oh, oh I, I think that's what it is too because it, there's it, it somehow hits different that he didn't die in battle like he he got them through he saved them all and it's not until they're done and walking off and he just collapses and like oh god yeah that one gets me every time um, this is why I wanted to have you on because I knew you would bring the mustard <laughs> of like the very good bridge burners to talk about that I would have never thought of. That was a really good one. <laughs> I, yeah. Um, oh, I just thought of one more I wanted to call out and now I don't remember. I interrupted you. No, I, uh, that's all right. We can totally move. Oh, God, I, I, this is not a small one. Um, hedge. Oh, yeah. Uh, that's a good one. Uh, and what made me think of it was when you were talking about Trots going out like a true bridge burner. I don't know if anybody goes out in more bridge burner fashion than Hedge does, throwing that cusser at his feet Dude. to save the rest of his squad, man. That... And, and it kind of goes back to the, the stuff that you were saying about the inward versus the outward or showing the emotion and stuff, because it's like those guys are constantly, you know, bickering. And that's why I think I vibe with it too, is because like, I have a lot of that kind of um, bantery type relationships with my like really close, you know, people I, like my sister and people I really care about and you're close, you know what I mean? You give them a hard time, but it's like motivated by love and stuff, but it's like total brutal honesty. There's like a nugget of truth and that, that you crank up to like a 17, um, you know, but then at the end, it's like when it comes time to, to ride or die for them, um, you, you do it right. And Hedge is like a cool character. Cause he is kind of always complaining a little bit. I'm curious to know what you think about the romance, the Hedge and Detorin, Cause it seems like, I don't know if you call it a romance, like she <laughs> seems to kind of like manhandle him, but then you get insight later on, I think from, I don't know if it's Picker again, who always has these like, you know, no, you know what? It's blend. You, do, I always think of her as this, like, cause she's fading into the background. And so you think of her as the quiet one Yeah. Um, and Picker's really fresh and in your face, but blends the one who picks up on everything. And part of that is because she can go and eavesdrop. Yeah. Um, but even in situations where she's not like using her skills to, to blend in and listen in on things, uh, she's the one who catches things and I'm pretty sure now I'm going to be wrong, but I'm pretty sure it's her. That's like, you know, if he didn't like it. <laughs> like yeah, exactly. And so there's just that, again, that, uh, weird little kind of, I guess that's just how the, the friendships there are. It's like a forged in the crucible kind of thing. And then, <laughs> who knows? It's, uh, you're right in that like I think that's part of why I love the soldiers is that yeah I recognize that banter that is that's how you talk to people you love really yeah which seems strange but that sort of back and forth like you can't do that with someone you don't know or really care about right yeah um and I think it's not just the banter but also the arguments that really they do genuinely not like each other sometimes totally um and 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 to me that's because they're more of a family really than they are friends this is a group of people they wouldn't necessarily have chosen to spend all of their time with that are going to drive them crazy sometimes that they don't always like but uh at the end of the day, the day they love them and they die for each other because they don't really care you know it's so funny like that none of them are really like that politically 
motivated even at the higher levels like whiskey jack and stuff like that it's like they're basically in it for for each other it's like okay there's this like broader stuff going on and we you know have orders to go this place and that place or whatever but it's like they're never like really out you know monday morning quarterback in the the kind of political stuff that's happening every now and then they kind of like recap and you hear somebody like oh here's what's going on out there and stuff but they're mostly just doing it for the you know because like you said it's just that's a life right no this is uh it is it's their life and it's uh this family that's been created and i think none of them are there fighting for the empire like that's not that's not they they, they're there because they needed a job and this is where they ended up and now they're fighting for each other and i think the the political stuff only comes into it in terms of because they're fairly involved in that they 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 know a lot about what's going on oh yeah um is is just about keeping each other alive yeah it's it's they learned that it costs to not know what's going on totally oh so good so good um what else oh yeah what about talk the younger because he kind of is one of these characters who's you know he 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 wants to be a bridge burner so bad right and you see him gardens on the moon and then you don't see him again in dead house gates or even hear anything about him um but that dinner hits hard in gardens on the moon where he's like really trying to uh and I guess maybe that's where a lot of the reverence for the bridge burners comes from. Oh, did you, did I lose you? You froze a little bit. Oh no. I don't know goodness. if you can hear me. So I'm back anyways. Oh. Technical right. difficulties. Like that's, it happens. Dude, this is the joys of um, online collaborations, but the upshot is that we can collaborate from thousands and thousands of miles away. So we take the good with the bad. So, right. Um, but what that's I was right. going to, no, go ahead. Sorry. Oh, I was just going to say, it's funny as you are like a thousand miles away from me, I think. And yet still in terms of, of, uh, we're probably the closest to each other in terms of, yeah, we're, uh, the other last two verse. We're like neighbors practically from right? the standpoint of pretty much everybody else in, in the discord. So, uh, but the, the, the thing I was trying to ask you before I, my internet provider totally let me down was about talk because I don't know um, if we totally consider him a full fledged bridge burner at this point, but you know, that dinner and stuff and um, his desire. And I think, you know, the, the love that we have for the bridge burners in some ways comes via the talk POVs, right? Because he definitely um, holds him in high regard and we get that. And so um, I love talk just as a person anyways and stuff, but he has that bridge burner love. And uh, what's your, what's your talk, what's your talk take? My, my take on talk? Yeah. Uh, I don't know how far to get it. So we're still in non-spoiler territory. I don't know. Right? Well, we've been going for a while. Maybe we should go uh, spoilers now since we covered our favorite bridge burners. We already talked about the origin stories. And so maybe um, if you're not past memories of ice and and don't want to go like full spoilers for the rest of the book then well now's your chance to just uh look in my video description where i have quick gen's channel link below and i'll throw out um the the shirk allow video which i also posted in my raft collab because i think everybody should go watch that that one's a hoot although i guess if you're leaving now you won't go watch a shirk allow no, um, video <laughs> but you can at least click that subscribe and thanks but yeah what let's go full spoilers for for everybody else because um talk does become a a bridge burner and he kind of starts he kindles that fire for us as the reader from book one well all right so i was because i think you just started talking about talk when we cut out yeah um and i was trying to remember like at what point he sort of gets that honorary bridge burner status because yeah. he doesn't really interact with them in the first three books much really there's the like he picks up Pran and he brings him and there's the dinner and then uh you know he gets sucked into that oh, war yeah. and then on the way to Darujistan and uh and then spends all of memories of ice um off doing his own thing yeah with you know tool and lady envy and then later um with the tennis gallery yeah. um, and so we don't we we know he has this love but he we 
we don't ever see him interact. And so I was trying to remember, and I want to say it's not until the very end when he yeah. uh, kind of goes to Hood's Gate, or, the, like, or it's not Hood's Gate anymore, is it, though, at that point? Yeah. Um, uh, but he's uh, when he's approached by the Guardians, and they're kind of like, uh, um, is it is he's, Isker Jirak says, you're one of us. Yeah, totally. Like, it's yeah. at the very end. They go through all that and then they're sitting there and then everybody like rides off and he goes, ready, bridge burner. And then they turn and roll yeah. off. And that was like, oh, yes, that was the so good. So uh, good. Because if because if anyone deserved it, man, talks the one like he got beat up worse than any. All right, maybe not any other character, but he's got to be up there. I mean, yeah, he goes, he stands out definitely uh, memorable wise for, you know, just having gone absolutely through the ringer and uh, I guess come out the other side in a, in a weird way. Um, but, you know, that, that kind of uh, is, is, it it's mirrored in the bridge burners thing and i'm curious what you think about the whole did you read the erickson essay the recent one about the the death and the way he deals with death and all that because like um you know and and i love mike's channel to death and i'm i can't wait to watch him go through more books because he's like yeah i'm not going to care about like people dying anymore right. and i can't wait to put that like to the test yeah i think anyone who's read the full series when he said that was like just wait. <laughs> yeah. And I love it. That's what's going to make it so fun watching him go through his, uh, his read, right. Is cause you know, we care. And actually, you know, for me, it doesn't, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't cheapen the sacrifice, right. You know what I mean? It's like the, cause it's not like they're chilling in the afterlife and they're basically just living full lives and stuff. I mean, they're, you know, for, for kind of all intents and purposes, they're gone and <laughs> you know what I mean? And so, um, but it's a crazy topic. It's a crazy concept to think about, you know. Did you read uh, that essay? Yeah, yeah, I did. I did read the essay, um, which is, I mean, like everything he writes, amazing so um, and thoughtful and insightful. And uh, it, I think, um, it was great. It was really neat to be able to kind of see his thought process and how yeah. he's approaching death because it was, it's obvious throughout the books and 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 we see sort of even it just within the books how he's exploring all of these different aspects of death and that may and and the ways in which he's experienced it changes because we know that uh, his father was dying as you were at Toll the Hounds and that that impacted that yeah. um and 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 I think I've heard him talk about it too that sort of like where he was in terms of belief at the beginning of this series is not the same place he was at the end of it mm -hmm. um and and so that's how I see it is 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 it's this exploration of death and belief because we just we and I think I I don't want to presume anything but i think to a certain extent that's what the essay is about is that we don't know nobody knows and yeah. so it all comes down to these ideas and these beliefs and faith or these questions and these wonderings um and each of us has to approach it alone and in our own way um and that really that to me is what he's doing with these books he's exploring all of those different things these different beliefs these different attitudes these different ways of looking at it and because it's fantasy we get to actually see what happens to some of the characters after death we get to know and that's uh such an interesting thing to explore and i um it's not that i don't understand that argument and because everybody yeah sort of come every any any reading process is is sort of an interaction yeah and if you're doing it right anyway, like it's an interaction between the reader and and the story. And so you're always going to bring your own um, set of beliefs and expectations to that story and the way you interact with it is going to be affected by those things, right? Yeah. Um, and and so it makes sense to me that for some people, this idea of of that, well, yeah, they died, but we still get to see them. They're still around. It, it, it lessens the impact, right? Personally, um, it did not at all. I mean, I can't, 
we could we could spend forever just talking about the desks that have that impact on you. Um, yeah. So I went off for a while about that, didn't I? <laughs> no, I love it because I love like I really latch on to that idea that it's like an exploration. And he's like a such a, you know, Erickson's such a dude for putting himself out there and talking about that stuff and just being vulnerable because it does feel like, you know, he's just kind of do, doing kind of that self work to <laughs> through the book, you know what I mean? And he doesn't, um, and he's just like figuring out and stuff and exploring and like not really telling answers and, and, and I like that. And, you know, for me, it's crazy because here, you know, and that's why I think the ending is so poetic with the bridge burners becoming like the guardians of the path and stuff, you know what I mean? Cause it's like, and I don't know, the bridge burners are kind of like, you know, it's like they mirror Erickson in a way, or that's like, that's what Erickson would be. It's like, here they are. These are like total badass dudes, like sappers who can blow up stuff better than anyone, you know, mages that can shoot the biggest fireballs, like all the stuff, you know? And, but they're like these like um, philosophical, like contemplative, uh, like empathetic, like caring people. They're like walled off and dickheads too. And like all this other stuff, but like, you know what I mean? Like there's that, that kind of aspect to them too. And, um, and I love that, that kind of being the, the God of death or whatever. I don't know what you would call, you know, what their role now would be, but that's like, that is, and somebody even says somewhere in the books about how that's like, how comforting it is that guys like that. And like the, you know, people who respect, you know, death and all the cool stuff with the traditions that they followed on the battlefield, they're just dudes, you know what I mean? They're just awesome people like that. Um, and, and that part is so cool. I love that. Yeah, I think um, it it just changes it changes the way you feel about what characters that you love and know are going to eventually have to come to those gates, like what that experience is going to be like. So it's comforting in that way too. Yeah. Um, especially because Hood, for most of the series, is sort of this like classic death figure. He's like a scary monster, big scary guy with a hood that you know people talk about him they're probably swearing so <laughs> it's it's not he's never a comforting visage like it's not something that nobody wants to go to hood's gate right yeah uh but or nobody wants to encounter hood um and so this idea of having this group of men and women who um god they just they have those that interconnectedness um that hood and probably any jag hut really um can't ever truly understand right um and that gives them empathy in a way that i i think um not that hood isn't capable of empathy we know he is but yeah um but i think there was also a lot of pain and anger in his role yeah the, and pain yeah for sure yeah totally yeah um and, and, and you read carcanus right so you uh, I have. Uh, it's been a while, so don't expect me to remember details. No, but, but yes, yeah, I, like, but I, even his uh, taking of the thing, it's like he's all his whole deal is rooted in getting screwed over, right, or being hurt. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Um, which I guess, I guess, is something the bridge burners share with him. But they, it's, it's, they had each other to like get through that. Like that's how they survived was being able to lean on each other, and totally. um, and so that to me is what makes the difference. Totally. And it made them like bigger than themselves. It's interesting because, you know, you talked about how Erickson changed, or, like that must have been kind of game planned out for them to be, you know, the new hoods or whatever, essentially at the end. I'm sure he knew that, you know, I'm sure there was stuff he figured out along the way, but that seems like one of the big uh, plot points that he probably had mapped out from the beginning. And you talked about how much he like changed and stuff, but in a way it's like the kind of whole arc is like one of the takeaways, at least for me is like, you know, not, not being, a not having that same fear of death or whatever, or just like kind of more like being, you know what I mean? Being able to, to kind of accept that death is a thing and then move on and not having it be this kind of scary boogeyman, like you said, is kind of a really cool aspect to the bridge burner story. Well, I mean, he called it the the book of the fallen. Yeah. So, like, really, it's it's kind of there in the the beginning that this is. 
uh, this is not going to have a happy ending, even though I, I, I actually love the ending and it, it did, it felt satisfying and happy in that respect, but you knew yeah. going in that like, like, uh, these characters were not, most of them were not going to survive this, this journey, whatever it was. Yeah. Yeah. And I love that, uh, Ruth Ann Bad always like emphasizes that people never like read the foreword or whatever of Gardens of the Moon where like Erickson basically says like, yo, we're going to go in hard and we're going to do this work together and and so um yeah that is a, a super cool just whole part of it so we did talk what about just uh just for fun um i want to know what you want more of right because the the whole bridge burner thing kind of wraps up in memories of ice and then it kind of wraps up in dead house gates with them taking on this new mantle but then there's also still some people alive. So I want to know, like, you know, if you had your druthers, uh, who who would you want to explore both from a kind of prequel standpoint, go back and see like an origin story for, and Whiskey Jack doesn't count because we already kind of got that from, from Ice, uh, which I mm -hmm. absolutely love peeling back the curtain and getting like to finally see what's up with Dujack and Whiskey Jack back in the day. But then also, what do you want to see? Who do you want to see come back in in uh, in November when we get the book? Uh, all right, the prequel is actually e an easier question for me because uh, I have I have given this some thought. <laughs> OK, good. Um, and honestly, awesome. if, if, if we could have uh, any story, and this is any, like this isn't, even if you hadn't limited me to the bridge burners, uh -huh. this is what, I, this is the story I would want to see. And that is uh, the bridge burners and Black Dog Forest. I love the Mata regulars and yes. I mean, like the whole story. We even talk about like the table going back and forth. Yes, I know. Uh, um, that to me, like, like, getting bridge burners and my irregulars um and all those other big players in there like that would be heaven for me oh. um if i had to choose one character and i don't know that it's it's not enough to to fill a book but i think it would be a very interesting story i want spindle's backstory yeah. like what is the deal with his mom and that hair shirt like he's the only one that like i and i don't think we ever really get the full like scope of what that's all about yeah i love it that would be an awesome one dude spindle is such a great character and his whole warren too and like how it freaks out all the the cats and stuff and he's a big player in that card game too and i love how um he's kind of like the stand-in for fiddler and that's like the whole thing about the table is just so quintessential bridge burner you know what i mean where it's like they're stopping in the middle of the war and the and the mod regulars right because back and that's why it'd be great to see the table be like the big cameo in that show or something or whatever they did i i i swear i like yeah i could probably read a book just about them stealing tables back and forth and i would be happy <laughs> in the middle of a war like people are dying but they're like dude we gotta play our card game though like we gotta get the table <laughs> Yeah, they get sneak in and get the table. And that actually might have been that was another great Paran moment where he catches them with the table and they're like, oh, look, we found this stolen table. Both <laughs> sides like, were total deadpan because he was, too. And he's like, oh, good. And I'm sure you're about to just bring that back right now. Uh -huh, exactly. Just the four of you by yourselves. Uh, and uh, and then pack up we're leaving in the <laughs> middle of this tonight. like parley with like these you know <laughs> that we've been like basically mortal enemies with for i don't know, like a decade and they're like you know yeah but we got our card game though mm -hmm. Love and, it. Then, and then at the very end like you've got all this just really heavy stuff going on and i mean they're saying goodbye to whiskey jack and uh, like it's sort of wrapping up all of these really tragic storylines and they're the bull brothers walking off with the table uh, uh remember that and then uh peran and quick Ben actually step out of the table and at the like, end but i i love that little that little cameo that like once again they're taking it back <laughs> yeah exactly and the high marshal i forget which high marshal it was they're all high marshals but one of them was still there and he's like He's like, you got a problem or something? And he's like, no, he's like, except for that's a, that's a table, not a door. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> so good. Um, oh. So yeah, so that would be my prequel. In terms of coming back, it, it, that's a little hard because I, I feel like, I don't know. Um, 
I, I'm, I love all the characters. I'm going to be happy to see any of them show up. I don't know that there's any of those, any bridge burner storylines that I didn't feel got wrapped. Like, I feel like they all wrapped up pretty nicely. Um, yeah. I wasn't left feeling hanging with any of them. No, me neither. Although I am interested to see if, uh, if Gano shows up because he might have to induct Carsa into his, uh, his little deck of dragons, depending on which way, you know, how willing, I guess, the god becomes or not, or whether that's <laughs> even a, a factor in such things. So, uh, uh, although biggest bad just brought up to me the other day on the server that he wants to see shirt come back. Oh yeah, and now I really want that, which is totally off topic, but uh, I that's the one character that I'm like, yes, that would be awesome. <laughs> well, you gotta think the like lines of commerce are gonna be a lot more open now and stuff. So, and she's uh, you know pirate captain extraordinaire, mm -hmm. so she's gotta gotta have some prime uh, opportunities to be in the area where stuff is actually um, going down. What else? So what, did, what about what about you? I, Any like I, I want to see Ganos come back. Yeah. I still oh, yeah. hope oh, you, yeah. you get a like uh, a a fiddler fishing kind of for some reason they find a reason to go get a beer at Smiley's bar or something. Like I'm a I'm a sucker for that. Like I go mm -hmm. for the band of brothers kind of aspect the other thing is you know i wouldn't mind uh and this probably is more likely is you get some darugistan stuff right and again i think uh i'm with you the picker and blend high up there for me and so that's uh you know i want to go and see if there's anything going down at kroll's bar or something and who knows actually you know what i think i might go in terms of bridge burners i might go with one of the big ones i want more i want more quick then <laughs> boom yes hundred percent. And as far as prequels, that's the big prequel that I want. Like that's one of the big things I'm hungry to try and connect the dots on in the, uh, in the walk in shadow, because he's like said that there's hints in there about quick Ben origin stories and I've racked my brain, but again, um, you know, well, I'll see you in class next week, obviously at, uh, at the Ruth Ann bad university, but that's one I'm hungry for too. He, he picked a tough one to try and explain. I got to admit like that's, <laughs> He, he I goes still for, don't know who he is. I know. Well, I think he's probably, you know, the high fist is just going to warm up on quick Ben, but I'm really trying to push him to, uh, to take on shadow throne next. I think that will be like, hopefully Ooh. the, uh, maybe the graduate level course or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. That would be a tough one. Um, <laughs> I'm not doing that. No, God, nope. Nope. Yeah. Ruth, Ruth can have that one. <laughs> exactly. What did we miss? What did we not talk about bridge burners wise that we really should have? Because we talked about the kind of bromance aspects and, but there's so much there. Like we could make a 10 hour long collab probably if we wanted to. Um, that's a good question. I don't know. I, I feel like, yeah, I could sit and talk about these guys all day long, um, happily, but I, I think we covered the big stuff, right? Because because really, after Memories of Ice, you know, we didn't talk about the whole uh, Tano Spirit Walker thing and the song and yeah, uh, which is so cool. And their just whole ascension to that thing, which is you know, that's one of the cool things about all the books that I love is that you know all those seeds that are getting planted. Like Ganos kind of just says, you know the little blessing like offhanded you know and there's no way to know that that's going to be like more consequential and then like you have the thing in deadhouse gates would you totally just skate past and would never like you know kim lock the spirit walker and he touches fiddler's arm and it's just such a tiny you know insignificant yeah. thing and total um, madness yep uh and hedge coming back i i think that is one area though it just going back to the death thing that since you brought that up is you know the whole other side of death and exploring that for fiddler and i thought that was like a really interesting aspect where like you know um hedge comes back and fiddler's like dude i already like greed for you and what would that be like you know it's like you kind of you know yeah, everyone thinks like oh my god it'd be great the lost loved one comes back and stuff but like have you ever really like tried to explore that I, and you know, I think I just realized probably the last time through is that, that his reaction to Hedge is foreshadowed a little bit mm -hmm. when, and I cannot remember who he was talking to, but um, 
when they talk about this whole like the the spirit walker thing and the fact that yeah. they've all ascended and that like isn't that comforting to you and he's he's like you know i gotta go spend all of eternity and you know yeah there are people i love but they're really just kind of a bunch of assholes <laughs> uh, yep. and 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 for me i think that was how fiddler dealt with his grief because you knew he was absolutely brokenhearted and so he sort of gets this like yeah i didn't like him all that much anyways like you know what what they were a bunch of jerks and i'm totally fine um and then we see that when hedge comes back this sort of like no no i'm done with you like this is i already kind of walled off that part of my heart because that's how i survive right yeah the total um, defense mechanism the scar tissue right it's like the mm -hmm. wounds happen and then like they harden over and it's like a, got a protective layer now that won't let anything in there anymore and it's so frustrating too to watch because you want them like back together um which makes that another like uh, there are a lot of moments that made me tear up and crippled god but when when the two of them sort of walk off together like yeah. come together and and make up and for it that one that got to me yeah totally because that's the moment you want right you want the big high five moment the the big bro hug and all that mm -hmm. stuff and that's why that's why he's the best that's why it's so good i know god yeah that hedge thing is and actually i'm surprised because he shows up in the one of the um dramatis personas or however you say that as like dead hedge and i was like oh my god so whoever skims those things is in for some spoilers i guess but uh well hey we did so much i love the bridge burners and uh and i think that what i'll say is uh that we'll just leave it here for now but that we'll pick this up again uh in the future thank you so much for coming on i i really enjoyed it i had an absolute blast um love to do this with you again anytime any topic it i'm gonna was hold you so to that fun. <laughs> yeah i'm gonna hold you to that very cool well everybody out there i hope you enjoyed it too bridge burners absolute uh bomb set of of draw i think they're the hook right for this at least for the first act and so uh you know the the hook from a last tube i think is very quickly becoming quick gen's channel so you're cheating yourself if you don't go over there right now uh click that subscribe if you watched all the way into this video and you're not going to go over there and subscribe then um you know you've got issues i don't know what to tell you because uh i'm a huge fan i know you will be too and uh we'll leave it there until we pick it up on malaz and humor and all the other good stuff that we're going to talk about in future collabs. So uh, yeah, until next time, happy reading.